Good evening. I'm Paul Taylor, Acting Director of Cultural Engagement at Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, and we're delighted to be hosting this online event to mark the publication of Stratford Wills 1348-1701, the latest publication from the Dugdale Society. The Birthplace Trust has worked closely with the Dugdale Society since its foundation in 1920, so this event is also taking place during the centenary of the Society. We're proud of this long-standing relationship and we're pleased to manage the local archives and records relating to Stratford-upon-Avon and the surrounding area, having done so since the Trust was founded in 1847. This area of our collection dates back to the 11th century and includes local government records, parish records and the archives of local businesses, organisations and individuals. This evening we will hear from Chris Dyer, the chair of the Dugdale Society, from the sponsors of the volume, Wright Hassel Solicitors and Roger Fox, and the main part of our programme will be the editors of the volume, Steph Appleton and Mari MacDonald, in conversation with Professor Lena Rawlin. And we'll close with some final remarks from Bob Behrman, the general editor of the Dugdale Society. So I'm now delighted to welcome Chris Dyer, the chair of the Dugdale Society. Well, Good thanks evening. very much for that introduction and a general thanks to the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust for the long-term help they give to the Dugdale Society and in particular for setting up this evening which uh, uh, which um, Paul Taylor and uh, the staff of the uh, Shakespeare Birthplace Trust are uh, must be thanked. Right, well the Dugdale Society, for those of you who don't know about it, is the Warwickshire Record Society as it would be called if uh, we didn't have in Warwickshire the memory of the great historian of Warwickshire, Sir William Dugdale, and whose name was chosen to adorn the, uh, the society. So, so the, 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 the function of the Dugdale Society is to publish records. We publish documents relating to the history of Warwickshire. And it's my great uh, privilege and pleasure to introduce uh, a, a launch of uh, a very special volume, um, the volume of Stratford Wills, uh, which is marking the it's, it's appearing in the centenary year, and it's special because it's a, a very a very scholarly and also extremely long book. Uh, it actually runs to two volumes, and the lucky members of the Dugdale Society get two volumes for the price of one, if you like. Uh, in this uh, in this uh, in this centenary year. So um, what I want to do now is just to say something about the publications of the of the society and and about this book in particular. We try to publish a variety of of, uh, of books uh, about different periods and different themes. Uh, the last one we produced was about uh, Coles Hill small town in North Warwickshire in the uh, in the Middle Ages uh, and before that we published a book of uh, the records of a tribunal held uh, to uh, hear appeals from uh, men wanting exemption from service in the First World War so we we stretch from the from the 12th century to the to the 20th um, and we try to have a great variety of volumes and this one of course falls into the mainly early modern period. It's mostly 16th and 17th century. We've published a volume of inventories in the past, that is the lists of possessions which were attached to wills, but we didn't publish the wills themselves. The words of the, of the people leaving their, uh, leaving their goods and settling their affairs uh, uh, before they died. And uh, the, the collection of wills that, that has been brought together is, has got something for everybody. Uh, it's, uh, if historians of religion will find lots of references to people's beliefs. You can, you can work out whether someone is a Protestant or a Catholic in the, in the middle of the 16th century, at the time of the Reformation, from the, wor the words that they use. There's a lot of social history different people, different ranks of society, uh, country people, town people, uh, men and women, people of all ages and classes. It's a, a very comprehensive um, coverage of a, a wide spectrum of society. And uh, uh, 
uh, there's a lot about property, of course, and about people's land and houses, possessions, furnishings, all these things. Um, uh, there's, there's culture in it as well. We find out about people's books. And of course, one will is the most famous of all is that of William Shakespeare, because he was resident in Stratford uh, when he died. And so therefore he uh, his will is included. Uh, and you can read there about the second best bed being left to his wife. Right. So there's a lot of interest in this book. I now want to just say how proud we are of this of this of this edition of this book. And uh, the people who should feel proudest about it are the two editors who you will meet in a short time, uh, Stephanie Appleton and Mary MacDonald, uh, who have labored long and hard and with extreme skill and dedication to the to the editing work. And they've been uh, helped and, and, and encouraged by Bob Behrman, the general editor, who you'll be hearing about, from, from whom you'll be hearing as well. I want to, I'm praising the book because I'm hoping you'll want to possess it. If you're a member of the society, of course, it'll come, it'll come to you uh, automatically. But if you could join, if you're not a member, then if you join the society, you would get a copy. And uh, uh, Bob Behrman will be giving you details later on how you can become the proud possessors of this uh, tremendously interesting and important, important book. Right. So let me move on now to my uh, next guest. Uh, the a book of this size and scope costs a great deal of money. And we've been the society has uh, has its own funds of course but it needs help with such a large project and we are very very grateful to people who have contributed uh, to the cost and provided us with some financial help and the first uh, benefactor i want to mention is wright hassel the solicitors uh, and uh, tracy ashby uh, uh, represents that uh, uh, that, that, that organization and she will be speaking to you next. Uh, good evening. Um, I am just wanted to um, say a few short words really about how on um, behalf of Wright Hassel and myself as head of the, the team that prepare a lot of wills currently, how uh, pleased we were to be approached by um, Chris Dyer and the Dugdale Society to to look to sponsor uh, the, an edition of um, the, the book that was going to talk about wills. Obviously, from my own point of view, I find wills extremely interesting, um, whether that's current wills or historical wills, um, and we can never underestimate the importance of making them or having any, any further experience and, and knowledge of them. So um, we, as Solicitors will always feel that they're um, eminently important um, and we were, as I say, really interested to be a part of, of sponsoring this project. So um, well, I'm going to hand over to our chairman, who unfortunately can't be here this evening, but we have a video from him um, and he's prepared a few words for you all. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nick Abel. I'm chairman of Wright Hassel LLP. Uh, Warwickshire's leading law firm. Um, I am very grateful to have been asked to address you this evening and I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person. Um, when Professor Christopher Dyer approached me back in 2019 and asked whether Wright Hassel would be interested in helping to fund the publication of these two volumes about uh, the wills of the people of Stratford-on-Avon. Um, I personally would had no hesitation in, in recommending to the partners of Wright Hassel that they should say yes. Unfortunately, it took them rather longer to identify the right budgets uh, before they came back and gave that confirmation formally, but it seemed to me that it was very sensible for Wright Hassel to be associated with such uh, a work. Um, and it's great to see these two splendid volumes now published and being officially launched today. Uh, and uh, huge congratulations to both Stephanie and Mary for the work that they've done in producing these volumes, which follow up quite nicely from the two uh, published in 2002 and 2003 by the Society, uh, which were the Stratford Probate 
uh, inventories. Um, I think it's uh, having had a quick look at the contents, uh, I'm very interested to, as a resident of Stratford-on-Avon, to um, be able to have a look at some of the famous families and, and, and what they were doing with their assets all those years ago. And you know, the Cloptons spring to mind, uh, the Hickocks of Welcome, uh, the Smarts of, uh, of Ludington. Um, and those, those, are, those are names which immediately spring to mind and it's great to see you know, where in the history of one's town these families fit. Um, and uh, the rich resource that the Dugdale Society has produced over the last 100 years, culminating now in these uh, volumes 52 and 53 of publications that they've had, uh, is clearly very, very valuable to the history of uh, our great county. Uh, and long may that continue. Um, I couldn't help thinking when looking through uh, the list of publications that the Society has had over those years that uh, the current government might like to have a quick look at one or two. Um, they keep going on and on about, um, about needing to get apprenticeships going. Well, you know, they can look back all those centuries ago, at the two volumes about Coventry and Warwickshire uh, apprentices and their masters, and perhaps even the current Chancellor of the Exchequer in looking for ways to pay for the money spent in getting us through this crisis and novel ways of taxing people might like to look at the volume regarding the uh, Warwickshire hearth tax uh, because people with big houses clearly have too many fireplaces and can afford to pay more in tax. But those are just some interesting thoughts I think. I'm delighted as a, as a uh, trustee of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust also to see that these two volumes have been dedicated to Dr Levi Fox and I think that's hugely appropriate in the centenary year of the society. Um, so I would just like to close by saying congratulations on publishing these two volumes, thank you for publishing these two volumes and thank you for allowing Wright Hassel to be part of the publication of them um, and let us hope that the society can celebrate its centenary rather better than by virtual meetings going forward. Uh, and here's to another 100 years of helping enrich the history of Coventry and Warwickshire. So thank you very much and have a good evening. Well, many thanks to Wright Hassel and to, to Tracy and Nick for their contribution. But uh, many thanks to Wright Hassel for their generous contribution to making this volume, volume possible. I now want to move on to another benefactor, uh, Roger Fox. Uh, Roger and I were at school together. We both went to the same school as William Shakespeare. There was a bit of a gap between his time and ours, but uh, we were, uh, it was a, 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 an important connection. And the school had a strong theatrical tradition. And Roger went on and made his, uh, made his living and his name in, 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 in the theatre. But uh, uh, his main reason for contributing to uh, make, help to make this publication possible was his, uh, the fact that his father, Levi Fox was uh, uh, for a long time uh, closely associated with the Dugdale Society, a leading figure of the Dugdale Society, latterly its, its, its chairman. And uh, we were able to um, dedicate the volume to the memory of Levi Fox. Uh, and uh, Roger will now speak about his interest in the, in, in the subject. Hello, right, thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here today as one of the sponsors of this wonderful two volume work celebrating of the Dugdale Society. Uh, as has already been mentioned by both uh, the former speakers, mother was a stalwart of the Society for over 60 years, and the name of Dugdale was inescapable through my formative years. Uh, I remember him working long into the evenings, uh, editing documents, wow. and especially when publication dates were looming and indexes had to be completed, and all the strings of cards uh, in use or, uh, while he worked, and, and he was very busy. Um, 
And when he'd done all of that, there was his ritual trip to the Oxford University Press, printers at that time, um, and they were followed some time later by the end of the long proofs, and then there were the long evenings checking those proofs. And that's why I undertake, appreciate the vast amount of work undertaken by our authors and our editor. And I must thank them for what I've been reading as a social publication, which I can, you can dip in and out of it with great ornament and uh, There are an awful lot of feather beds and bolsters, and uh, perhaps they could inspire a historical TV drama also, it would be the basis of it. Um, it's very, very interesting. You're never, never bored five minutes and you've found something new and very interesting. Highly recommended, get a copy. Um, I know that a long time will have come to pass from when the first words were being transcribed until the volumes finally arrived. Um, and I'm pleased how this Guinness Book of Records entry for the longest time in the book being typeset and printed has not been broken. The type for the Society's Comfrey Constable's presentment was first was set in type in 1949, but the book published 1988. Why, you might say? Well, the problem was the the author hadn't written the introduction. Rather, didn't find the time to do it until 1988. And well, he, then because the Oxford University Press were about to close their letterpress printing and sitting in a corner they had this pile of type locked up ready to print uh, so they rather twisted his arm and it was printed and that is how a Dugdale Society publication became a press book to come from the Oxford University Press that's one for your uh, trivial pursuits Anyhow, when I was approached about the idea of sponsoring this publication, I had hesitation in agreeing. And I'm proud of the work done by my father and society over so many years. And I'm really, really pleased to be able to new action and support the continuing work and publications wow. of the society. Thank you, Margaret. Well, many thanks, Roger, for those reminiscences of the earlier days of the Dugdale Society. Uh, but above all, of course, thanks very much for your generous support for the for for for, the, for this book. Uh, w w without these these grants, it would have been mm, a difficult probe to, to 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 bring these books to to, to publication. I now want to. Uh, introduce a distinguished speaker from the United States, Professor Lena Orlin, who uh, is uh, associated with the Trust, has worked a good deal in the archives in the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, and uh, is at this moment writing a biography of William Shakespeare. So who would be better qualified to uh, uh, introduce a discussion uh, involving the two editors of the volume that we are celebrating. So, Lena Orlin. Thank you so much, Chris. But in terms of who's speaking of qualifications, uh, we need to talk about the qualifications of the editors who have brought us this volume. I could scarcely imagine a better and more qualified team. Mari McDonald has such a distinguished record of research including having already edited a volume for the Dugdale Society on the uh, Stratford's Guild of the Holy Cross. Uh, Stephanie Appleton is the author of the book Women and Wills in Early Modern England, which is focused on the Stratford scene. And now Mari and Stephanie have given us this collection of what I think of as one of the best genres of the early modern period. Wills are not unmediated documents, as I hope we'll be able to talk about, they are filtered through uh, the scribes who wrote down what it was that testators wanted to say, to say. But still, 
for many, many early moderns, including shepherds and blacksmiths and servants. This is the only opportunity we have to come close to hearing their voices. Wills are our windows onto the things that they wanted to say, the things that they cared about, the people they cared about, and how it was that they lived their lives. Mari and Stephanie have given us 522 of these voices. Now, um, Mari and Steph, you close in 1699 at the end of the 17th century, but you begin in 1348. This is the will of John de Stratford. Although he died, hello, hello. although he died as, uh, John de Stratford died as Archbishop of Canterbury, he did not forget Stratford. And he remembered Stratford, for example, with the gift of beautifully uh, described ecclesiastical vestments, one set of silk with lions and small peacocks in gold, he said, don't we? all wish that that had survived. Um, I was also very struck by the fact that in his will he asked for diligent inquiry to be made in my manners, whether any of my tenants have suffered any wrong, and that amends be made. Now, I'm sure that we would like to think of that as a kind of early statement about social justice, but I suspect that it was more personally inflected. John de Stratford was making a good death for himself. Um, and that could involve charitable gifts as well as making amends. I wonder if you could say more about what a good death was in the period and what Wills had to do with that. Yeah, of, of course. Um, I'll, I'll kick off um, here. As you've mentioned, you know, it, it could encompass things like charitable giving, but broadly speaking, um, because there were many facets to it, um, a good death in this period was one in which a person met their end in, in a dignified and exemplary way. So appropriate conduct was required of both dying and those around them. And this behavior after death would demonstrate or be interpreted as demonstrating that the person in question had passed to their eternal rest in a positive way. Um, so what that meant in practice was in a spiritual sense, demonstrating your faith so not just immediately before your death, but also in life in terms of the preparation you had made for death throughout your life. Um, and in an earthly sense, setting your affairs in order, ensuring that relevant kin were provided for and that harmony was promoted in your family in the face of what would have been a very disruptive event. Um, and of course, the making of a will was crucial to both of these aspects. Almost all of the surviving wills that we have in the volumes begin with some kind of religious preamble which sets out a declaration of faith. Um, as Chris mentioned earlier, you know, these, these change over time and, and we can sort of broadly identify rough categories of religious persuasion. Um, but in the, for the majority of the period covered by these books, there's something at the very least along the lines of I bequeath my soul to almighty God to kind of demonstrate this, that 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 your your piety is being demonstrated here. Um, as you mentioned, Lena, we do have to be careful how we interpret these for, for many reasons. You know, most of the people in these volumes were not writing their own wills. They had a scribe doing it, so they might have had certain pressures exerted on them in that sense. Um, of course, if you if you had a private faith that you knew might be problematic, uh, if it was expressed more publicly, and of course, wills were often read aloud um, in a in a public sense to to family and and relatives, um, you might choose to conceal your personal faith with a more acceptable, more publicly acceptable declaration in the will. Um, but generally speaking, these preambles can give us a sense of how religious attitudes changed over time. Um, and, and they do at the very least serve as a kind of assurance that that piety has been demonstrated. And then of course, in terms of earthly preparations, that the will is crucial. You know, people use these documents to provide for any children that weren't yet married, to rem remember other kin that were close to them. And, and these provisions were formalized in the wills. Um, of course, it doesn't mean that 
other things weren't hinted at in wills and sort of family tensions and, and, and we may come on to that later but the will as a whole was a very important vessel for demonstrating that a good death had been achieved. Oh thank you so much so um, one of my favorite examples that I wanted to ask you about of a good death comes from the opposite end of the social scale from John to Stratford and that's the will of William Jones he was a farmer. He probably never married. He probably never had children, but he worked uh, in service uh, to a man named John Mace, and John Mace had a son named Thomas. Um, at the end of his will, the servant, Jones, declared, I confess that I found a purse and three shillings, four pence in it, a great deal of money. Um, and if the said Thomas Mace would take it of his conscience that the purse is his, my will is that he shall have it. You know, you could write a short story about it. Jones obviously knew who the purse belonged to, but yet he couldn't bring himself to return it until he was on his deathbed facing his maker. He was also facing the curate uh, of, the, of Holy Trinity Church, uh, William Gilbard. Uh, Gilbard was at Jones's bedside writing down his will. You, the two of you, have detected Gilbard's handwriting in 50 of these wills in all England. There's only one other scribe who is known to have written as many wills. And um, I wonder if you could tell us more about Gilbard. Well, first of all, I think it's fair to say that uh, in the way that you can sometimes like somebody immediately on sight of their handwriting, uh, increasingly rare nowadays, admittedly, and you think both Steph and I fell in love with William Gilbert. Uh, he has such a distinctive hand, we've used it on the cover of the book, um, and you just couldn't not use him. Um, and so Steph, is, I, most of the wills that fall within the period that Steph worked on, so I'm going to hand over to her to actually talk about William Gilbert the man our favourite person. Yes, <laughs> very much favourite person. Um, you know, and we have a, a, a whole section on him in the introduction because he's such a fascinating and seemingly ever-present character in these wills um, in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. You know, if he's not writing a will, then he pops up receiving gifts in other places or witnessing other wills. So it seems he was clearly well-known and well-liked um, within the community. But to give you a potted history, he was born in 1540. He became Stratford's assistant schoolmaster in 1561. And in the mid 1570s, he was appointed curate. Uh, he was married three times and fathered 12 children um, before his death in 1612. There may have been a couple of other children, but I couldn't quite place them to him exactly. So I settled at 12. Um, and, and lots of documents in, in his gorgeous distinctive hand survive. So the wills we have, inventories and other miscellaneous corporation records. Um, and the fact that so many of his wills survive, as you said, um, Lena, you know, we have, a, we have 50 of them, is really important because it allows us to examine his method and to be able to draw certain conclusions as to how he went about making these wills for the townspeople, which isn't possible when you have wills of a, of a much smaller sample size in one hand. Um, Gilbard, he, he seems to have followed a very rigid formula in his will making for his entire career, for example. Um, for example, he almost always opens the will with the date, um, a declaration of loyalty to the monarch and religious preambles that generally speaking conform to the Protestant faith, um, except in a very few instances where he deviates. Um, and, and this is interesting for us and important because it, it tells us a couple of things. On the one hand, it tells us that um, for the most part, the people of Stratford were happy to let Gilbard kind of do his thing when he was writing their wills. They were happy with what he had set out, worked for them absolutely fine. But then on the other side of that, there were clearly occasions where will makers wanted something a bit more tailored. They might want a slightly more robust declaration of faith. And in those, on those occasions, William was um, able to accommodate them. Um, so 
you know, it really gives us insight into the will making process. Um, you know, we do have a couple of later scribes in Stratford that we mentioned in the um, introduction that, that have left behind a smaller store of wills. But for me, William's, you know, gorgeous, expressive hand and the prolific output just makes him the most interesting. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. You're giving us a picture of wills as a kind of process of negotiation, which involve a scribe. And also, as you can tell from some other wills, also involve um, other people uh, kind of gathered around the deathbed, family members, household ser uh, members, servants, and so on. And one thing I wanted to say that I think is so brilliant about this edition is that you provide us through kind of headnotes and footnotes to some of these wills, information about a lot of the personalities. So when you're able to match a will to an inventory, you tell us about it. When we know information about uh, when the testator was buried, you add that. And there are, uh, so there are ways of approaching biography through this um, edition and the kind of fringe benefit of Gilbard's biography is a wonderful one uh, for people who are going to be looking at the collection. Um, sometimes Gilbard didn't make it to the bed side. That is, the family didn't have time to call a scribe. And in those cases, the, the, the dying person's last wishes were recorded as what are called nuncupative wills, that is oral wills, which means that people at the bedside were capturing, were witnessing what it was that the testator wanted to say, uh, how he wanted to um, bequeath his goods and so on. Shakespeare's son-in-law, John Hall, uh, dictated one of these non-cupative wills. You have an example that I'm much uh, more fond of, actually. I don't find Hall's will that personable, but I um, very much enjoyed the will of Elizabeth Hancox, uh, because it's clear from her will that there are a number of people gathered around the bedside and she, in her last words, called out to her nephew and said, I do intend to live and end my days with you. And to that end, I do absolutely give, absolutely give unto you, cousin, all my goods. Um, reserved a few coins to pay the men who were going to carry her body to burial, but she probably disappointed everyone else who was gathered around and who may have hoped to be remembered. Um, are there other of these kind of deathbed scenes uh, that stand out to you? Uh, yes, and actually, I, I, I know you were sort of less keen on, on um, John Hall's, but actually, I, I, I think he's, he's a really great example. Um, you know, with these non-cupative wills, which, as you said, were often hastily declared on the deathbed and then written down later, you often get that sense of voice coming through in a way that, that you wouldn't with um, wills that were written in, in, in a planned way. So John Hall, who was married to Shakespeare's daughter, Susanna, died in November 16th. And, and his will is only a few lines long, um, as non cubative wills often were, because they were very last minute. Um, and I just wanted to, to read an extract. Um, it says, concerning my study of books, I leave them, said he, to you, my son Nash, to dispose of them as you see good. As for my manuscripts, I would have given them to Master Bowles if he had been here. But for as much as he is not here present, you may, son Nash, burn them or do with them what you please. Now, of course, you, he's Shakespeare's son-in-law, so we may wish to speculate about what the manuscripts were that may have been burnt by his son if he so chose to. Um, but, you know, that really is speculation. Um, but, but what this will tells us in a, in a concrete way is, is, you know, who was present, his son was present, his friend Master Bowles had perhaps been summoned and, and simply hadn't made it in time, and that this really affected what John wanted to do with his possessions. Um, and so it really shows how those around the deathbed could influence what was going on in the will and, and sort of links back again to, to the whole idea of the good death. Um, Mari, what about you? Did, did you have any examples? Well, I've actually picked a couple of wills that perhaps don't follow the traditional pattern in that they're both made by people who are not surrounded by friends and family on their deathbed, uh, one of whom, in fact, has nothing to do with Stratford other than the fact that he died. But I, I think that they're indicative. Um, and the first one is a man called John Scott, alias Patterson, who 
is lodging in Stratford. He's lodging with the Carlos family. And it's not entirely clear whether he is passing through and lodging or he's a long term lodger. But whatever happens, uh, he's taken very ill overnight. And uh, he said the following day to his landlady, landlady, I was very sick this last night and I thought to call your husband to make my will. So he really, whatever it was, came very fast. Um, she then goes on to say, well, that's actually a very, very good idea. And, you know, they get together, whoever is there, to hear it. And when they're there, he says, presently, speaking to the said Hannah, that's his landlady, landlady, look after me and bury me and take what I have freely and willingly. I give it to you. Um, and I think that's very sad because it, the implication is that even if he had a, anybody to give it to, uh, he doesn't think whatever it is will get to them. Um, he probably doesn't have that much. Um, and that to me is a, is a sad death. But it's, uh, I think it's probably typical of many throughout the country. We're lucky. I think we have several really interesting ones. And that's one of them. Um, and the other one, the man himself has nothing to do with Stratford, although he's actually buried. Uh, he's in the Stratford Register. Is a, a man called Isaac Blancourt, or Blanken, as they put him in the, in the Register, who was clearly a soldier um, passing through or being temporarily billeted in Stratford with his troop. And again, we don't know why or how, but the fact that he's a soldier would suggest that he wasn't old, but he is on his deathbed. Um, and he bequeaths basically his money, uh, his clothes, um, his horse with all its accoutrements. So he's a, a cavalryman or, or a dragoon to his uh, fellow soldier, Captain Edwin Sands. Um, sadly, I haven't been able to find out anything about either of them. There are too many Edwin Sands and there are no Isaac Blancors. Um, but he has nobody but his um, companion, his comrade, to leave his immediate stuff to. And he then asked Edwin Sands to show kindness to his wife, Judith. Um, I don't know whether Judith was a camp follower with them or whether Sands knew where Judith lived. But again, it's somebody dying very much alone, in this case, away from home, with very little to leave. And I think it's very sad. And I find that these non-cooperative wills are the, the saddest because people are cut short. Yeah, Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's will was not non of course, but one of the things that I find interesting about it is that, um, as, as Steph said, it, one of his first lines is to one of the, the first line is to say that he bequeaths his soul to God. But the second line in most of, most of these wills is about bequeathing the body to be buried. And an awful lot of people who traveled between uh, places, as we believe Shakespeare to have done, would have written wills that were conditional in some way, saying, um, if I'm if I die in Stratford, I want to be buried in Holy Trinity. If I die in London, I want to be buried in St. Mary Lothbury, which is what happened with a lot of the Cloptons. But um, Shakespeare doesn't say that. So he seems to me to know that he's going to die in Stratford. Um, his will, of course, is one of the great features of this book. Um, and it's, it's an interesting will. Um, it has been said that it demonstrates animus towards his wife. Um, but uh, I think you have other wills. I hope you'll help us put his, the tone of his will into perspective. If we look at the will of somebody else, like, say, uh, Henry Sidnall. And um, could, you, could you tell our listeners about Sidnall um, or, in fact, any other kind of testy? wills that you'd like to talk about? Yes, uh, of course. And and Sidnell's will, for me, is really interesting because he seems very preoccupied with the, this concern about the possibility of his soon-to-be widow remarrying after his death. Um, you know, and this is a fairly common occurrence at the time, um, particularly if you were a woman with small children, it often made sense to become a family with someone else after the death of a husband. But 
So it was often a concern of, of male will makers, but we do see definite trends over time. So in the very earlier wills in the volume, men will tend to leave all of their goods to their wife, who, who is their executor, and they won't impose any conditions on her. She can do what she wants with the property. But definitely as we move into the middle and later part of the 16th century, onwards, you tend to see men leaving goods to their widows only for as long as they remain unmarried or they put other restrictions on them. So that there seems to be a definite growing concern with women moving on with property that perhaps should more properly stay with the children, perhaps. Signal, in particular, he clearly seems to have resigned himself to the fact that Joan would marry again, uh, his wife Joan would marry again, and in fact she did, only three months after he was buried, which I imagine even by the standards of the time was probably fairly swift. Um, but he was also convinced that Joan and this new husband would mistreat other family members left behind. So he left um, 12 pounds each to a couple of kinswomen, Margaret and Catherine Yate, and, and we don't know their exact relationship, but they're named as kin. Um, and he explains that Joan as his executor should pay Catherine the legacy on the day of her marriage, or when Catherine is misused by the husband of mine wife. He then leaves Catherine a further sum of money. It, it might be five pounds, but the will is damaged. Um, and that's to be given to her when Joan dies or else when she doth not use the said Catherine well. Um, and this is this is really strong language that's not commonly used in, in, in the Stratford will, certainly. So I think we can be reasonably clear that, you know, this is Henry's concern coming through in his will and perhaps he was acting on red flags from his wife's behavior to make that clear in his testament. How about you, Mari? Well, interestingly, I've, I've got two I'd like to talk about. Um, and one of them has an example, a converse example of uh, a wife remarrying and not being well treated. Um, John Court, an apothecary, made his will in the 1630s and died. And his widow Grace remarried in 1640 to a man called Christopher Pargister. And in 1655, her son, another John Court, is making his will. And clearly something has gone very wrong with the second marriage because he leaves to his Grace uh, Pargiter, wife under Chris Christopher Pargiter, my dear mother. And he gives her the bed, bedstead, furniture in the best chamber over the hall in the house. Um, so he's giving her the best furniture. Um, provided always that Christopher Parger to her husband shall have nothing to do with the same. So the husband can't come in and sell it off, do what he likes. Um, and there's a further indication that things are even worse than just that, because later on he tells his brother Willie that he is to board, feed and dress their mother for as long as she chooses to live with William. And if she decides that she wants to set up her own household, then she's going to get £10 a year. And the money is to be given to her so that my mother may not be wronged by her unkind husband. Now, that to me suggests that there is a separation and that she is no longer living with her husband. And I imagine that was probably quite a scandal at the time in, in 17th century Stratford. But this is a case of the son being concerned for his remarried mo um, mother and perhaps husbands who put restrictions on their wives' legacy to be dependent on marriage worried about that as well. Um, but I've got, I've got another one which is a much more direct from family um, problem, if you like. In 1670, um, William Linden, who was a quite substantial monster, was making his will. Um, now, he had no children, but he had married a widow with two sons, with whom he got on very well indeed. And he makes very generous requests to them of property and money. Um, but he's obviously one of those very much of the period, somebody who wants the property, the bulk of his property, to descend 
in the family name. So he, the bulk of his property goes to his nephew, William Linden, who is his namesake. And William Linden is also his executor. So there's nothing desperately unusual about that. But two years later, he makes a codicil for that will. Um, and he says he recites what he'd done in the past, but he's making a change now because since the making of my said will, I finding him, the said William Linden, my kinsman, to be very deceitful and unfaithful. So William Linden, the younger, has somehow or other blotted his copybook with his uncle. So he gives his stepchildren and his widow larger legacies. But nonetheless, that old sort of patriarchal uh, primogeniture thing creeps in because he still makes William Lyndon the Younger his residuary legacy and his sole executor. And a few years later, when the younger William Lyndon makes his will, um, he is clearly doing very nicely. Thank you. So I would love to know just what the nephew did to so seriously upset his uncle that he was prepared to spend money on a, on a codicil to the will. But, you know, the family line still won out in the end. We've been talking about um, disputes, if you like, and I'd just like to perhaps end this section with a, a will that is completely the opposite. Um, and that's the will of um, Adrian Quiney um, in 1693. He is based in London, as many of the Quineys and the Sadlers ultimately were, making their money there. Um, but his brother William lives in Stratford. Sadly, William is a lunatic. He was declared officially and legally a lunatic in 1666. Um, so he's been a lunatic for a very long time. And Adrian leaves money to a lady called Jane Kirkham, who he says has been looking after him for more than 20 years. Um, and what he says is, she, by her peculiar tenderness over him, hath gained from him in a great measure the respect due to a parent to the sole intent may, that his life may be as easy as his deplorable condition will admit. So she's been a really good and faithful servant. And Adrian says so much so that he regards her as a sister. She's that close and that important to the family. Um, there's a slight thing in the tale, in a sense, but he then gives her a legacy of £20, but he leaves William to her care. So he's looking after William for the rest of his life, uh, emotionally and financially, but poor Jane, in a sense, is lumbered with him. But nonetheless, there's a very strong link there between essentially a servant and, and the family she works for. So you can get all sorts of hints of family relationships from these documents and and family drama and oh. um and i you know i i think that they're one of the ways in which they're so interesting is that they make they show us how kind of undramatic shakespeare's will is mm -hmm. and i think the bequest of the second best bed i don't think there's drama around that either and your wills put this into context for us because we see we encounter so many best beds and second best beds and best cloaks and second best coffers um, and all kinds of possessions that are kind of ranked in that way just as a means of identifying what they are. Um, I'm really interested in Shakespeare's will though uh, in his charitable bequest because other biographers have said that the 10 pounds that he gave to the poor in Stratford was not very generous. And I wonder if you have, uh, thought about what context is provided in other wills in terms of uh, people of that rank and how generous they were to the poor in town. I mean, the whole issue of charitable requests is a phenomenally large one because um, you can trace them right back from John the Stratford right through to the end <coughs> in varying degrees. And they range in amounts from hundreds of pounds to pennies. Um, not all necessarily dependent upon the um, the rank, the social status of the testator. But I think if we're going to do justice to Shakespeare, is you need to look at him in context of um, his status uh, as a gentleman and look at other gentlemen. 
Um, and I've sort of roughly looked at gentlemen before 1647, which is when volume one ends. And there are 19 men who describe themselves as gentlemen in that period. 14 of them make charitable bequests. So five of them don't. Um, so that's the percentage to begin with. And the amounts left range from 20 shillings by Thomas Fisher um, up to 100 pounds left by uh, John Coon. And this was intended specifically to make rolling three-year loans to young or poor tradesmen in Stratford who were to pay it back with interest. And the interest was to be used to the benefit of the arms people. And that is very much a feature of larger, later requests that money is implemented for other purposes from that. Um, now, Coombe, obviously, was one of the most important local families, and he was immensely rich, both in land and money. Um, so this amount of this uh, bequest is perhaps not unreasonable. But his brother Thomas was also pretty well off. Um, and Thomas left only five pounds to the poor at Stratford in, in 1608. So you've got, in the same family, you've got two very, very wide extremes. Um, John Gibbs in 1625, he's one of the ones for whom we have an inventory. The total of his inventory was 307 pounds. His charitable bequest was 20 shillings. Oh my God. So, huh. you know, um, you can't really make judgment. But if you look at it as a whole, the majority of gentlemen uh, making charitable bequests in this period up to 1647 uh, make somewhere between five pounds and seven pounds. So Shakespeare's 10 pounds is pretty much up there with the average. Um, it's not excessive like um, the Coombe, John Coombe, but compared with Thomas Coombe, it's extremely, extremely generous. So I think to sort of judge Shakespeare as a standalone is totally unfair. He needs to be looked at in context. And I don't think, I think he's doing what he can, um, basically. Yeah, he did um, ask his uh, executors and survivors to put out an enormous amount of money uh, to support Judith, for example. So, mm -hmm. there. Um, so I'm I'm sure you're right that it was generous in in the context. Coom, the Coombe family is also interesting. I was really interested in, uh, in another way. Uh, a later Coombe, Thomas Coombe, in 1656, gave ten gowns to ten poor men and women, but he ordered that his initials T and should be on their breasts and on their backs. And um, that means that there were 10 people walking around Stratford kind of uh, branded as having received the charity, um, always reminded, being strat signboards for what it was, the person to whom they should be grateful. And I think that that's another thing that comes through in this collection is ways of seeing Stratford differently, insights into what the streets of Stratford were like, insights into what houses were like, descriptions of rooms and of possessions, how people lived in the period. Um, as you point out, of the 522 wills in the collection, 407 uh, were left by men. And that's largely because while women could write wills as spinsters or as widows, they weren't entitled to write wills while they were married. And I think your collection shows what a loss it is that we didn't hear from more women because women's wills have such uh, wonderful turns of phrase to me. I love that Anne Lloyd gave the ring I do usually wear upon my thumb and that Grace Gregory gave her daughter my old gown that is pulled to pieces. Um, were there other women's wills that you'd like uh, for people to know about? I want everyone to know about all of the women's wills. Um, <laughs> for me, it's it's really significant that we have them in the first place. Uh, you know, you, you've mentioned that a wife needed her husband's permission to write a will. But for me, it's also particularly poignant that 
a husband could withdraw that permission up to the point of probate. So a woman could have passed away thinking that she'd written a will and her wishes were going to be respected and her husband could have simply destroyed the will as soon as she had died. So I find that really um, touching and, and you know we don't know how many wives wills we might have lost in that way. So I'm really pleased to have all of the surviving women's wills of Stratford set out in this volume. Um, you know, of course, there are lots of interesting examples among them. Um, but if I had to pick one, it would be that of um, Isabel Sadler, who was the widow of John Sadler, a gentleman and from a wealthy Stratford family. And, and her wealth really comes through in her will. She mentions things like a silver nut bowl, a sugar dish, a gold ring. A, a dragon glass that could have been a mirror or it could have been a glass with a dragon shaped stem. We just don't know, uh, along with other items that are clearly of, of a high value. But she also left to her granddaughter, Eleanor, uh, 20 shillings to, to be paid when she got married, various other items. And then significantly here, one flaxen tablecloth and half a dozen of napkins, which linens are marked IS. And, and, and as you can see here, on this occasion, the will itself provides more than a narrative description of the item. The letters IS are enhanced by the drawing of the bell beneath, but also in contact with the letters. And, and that's clearly a play on her name, Isabel. And the fact that her scribe took the time to draw that in the will, probably on Isabel's insistence or guidance, indicates to us how significant these napkins may well have been to her. Uh, this might have been a motif or crest embroidered on the napkins. Um, and in leaving them to her granddaughter, Eleanor Quiney, who had married into another significant Stratford family, um, it was it would it would ensure that, that this gift was given in the female line and when Eleanor used them at uh, meal times, which were a very important time in early modern England to cement family ties, the motif on these napkins would have served as a reminder of their provenance and a link to the Sadler family. And, and this is the only illustration we find in the whole collection of 522 wills. So it's really great that we can have the image reproduced in the volume um, and to be able to mention it here. And, and could I say that I've read a lot of wills elsewhere and I've never seen anything like that. I think that is so extraordinary yeah. that we have that illustration of how we want her napkins to be marked. Um, we've only had a chance to touch on such few wills. There's so many that I would like to talk about, but um, unfortunately, we're reaching the limit of our time. So um, I want to speak for all our listeners, I'm sure, in thanking you both, Mari and Steph, for this wonderful volume. And um, I also assume that I'll be speaking for the two of you in thanking the man to whom we now turn, uh, the general editor of the Dugdale Society Publications and the dean of all things Stratford and all things Shakespeare, Robert Behrman. Welcome, Bob. I'm glad to see you. You can see me. I can. All right. I'm. Uh, my screen's gone peculiar, but. Ah, but you're here, well, and we can hear you as well. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, then, Lena, for sparking off such an interesting discussion, and um, of course to Mari and Steph for their equally stimulating responses under your interrogation. Um, my my job as en general editor of the Society's publications is to um, ensure the production of um, an annual flow of volumes to distribute to our members. They do then have to make more room on their shelves, but at the same time, they can't complain that their subscriptions are not being used um, productively. But to keep to this sh schedule, I have to persuade and chivy a succession of individual editors to come up with their texts on time. I mean, their labours are entirely voluntary, so I do have to tread carefully. Um, they mustn't get too upset and walk away, but they also have to be somehow persuaded to keep to some sort of a timetable. 
uh, in the um, society's archives, we do have a few examples of um, long drawn out processes before a volume actually uh, sees the light of day. And he, there's even occasional friction. But in this case, one of the biggest projects we've ever undertaken, uh, 1,000 pages in two volumes, the behavior of the editors, I have to say, has been um, exemplary. So I must first repeat our thanks <coughs> to Mari. Um, she first floated the idea in March 2013, and then to Stephanie, recruited the following year, who between them in six years have um, converted this idea into reality. Now, this is a hugely impressive achievement for a work of this size. I don't want to um, upset any of our other editors who may be watching, but in fact, Mari and Steph have overtaken several projects already in the theoretical pipeline. So it's a wonderful contribution um, to commemorate the Society's centenary and achieved uh, despite Mari getting marooned in New Zealand for five or six weeks at a crucial moment early in the year. Now, some of our members have already received their copies. Others will do so very soon, but please bear with us. Um, dis distribution, as you can imagine, is having to take place in really difficult circumstances. But I'm going to end, though, with a blatant sales pitch. Um, you've heard how the publication of this of, uh, of this volume has been greatly assisted by generous support from donors. All the same, we do need as well to sell copies of our books to non-members, both to uh, pay the balance and to carry over any surplus to support future publications. Now, anyone in the habit of buying books of this sort knows that two hard to pack volumes of this size would routinely set them back well over £100. But even at full price, you'll find these two volumes will be on sale for the amazingly bargain price of only £45 for the set. However, better than that, anyone who can persuade us that they've attended the launch this evening will be eligible for a £15 discount. A mere £30 then for the set plus postage, as long as they contact us by the 30th of September. And things actually don't even end there. As the uh, chair hinted, if you join the society, again before the 30th of September, you will, believe it or not, receive this publication in return for your subscription of only £20. And again, plus postage. You don't have to swear to remain a member of the society for 20 years, but we do hope that your um, conscience will steer you in that direction. And to take advantage of these amazing offers, no later than the 30th of September, go to the Dugdale Society's website, um, dugdale-society.org.uk, or, or just key Dugdale Society in your browser. Um, click on the contact button, and then email us to stake your claim. But by the deadline, again, of the 30th of September. Um, Chris Dyer has already referred to the two Stratford inventory volumes he published some years ago. Now, these really do have to be close at hand when you're consulting this new publication. And very conveniently, copies of these volumes are still available. So you might as well negotiate for these at the same time. And so to wind up, thanks to the Birthplace Trust, uh, Paul Taylor and his background team for hosting this event so efficiently. Thanks again to um, our donors, especially Roger Fox, to his father Levi, this centenary volume is dedicated. Thanks again to Mario and Steph for all their work and to Lena Orlin for generously finding time to help turn this into such an entertaining evening. And thanks to our present members out there for their loyalty. I hope they will be shortly joined by many new members. And thanks actually to um, our printers, Forward of, of Bristol, for producing these two fine volumes 
in such awkward circumstances. Now, at a normal launch, we then invite guests to enjoy a glass of wine and some light refreshments. On this occasion, I just hope you have made your own arrangements, as I have. So I do hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Goodbye.